Welcome to At Issue. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. We're going to be talking about siltation. In fact, for years and years here in central Illinois, we have been advised that we need to keep the silt out of the Illinois River, that silt is not doing any good in the river. Today we're going to talk about why at least some silt should go into the river and where it needs to go. And to talk about that is a woman who very much wants the silt down in New Orleans. Um, I'm pleased to have Dr. Denise Reed on the program. Dr. Reed is a, a professor at the University of New Orleans and is a geomorphologist. That's right. Uh, you're going to have to help me. Geomorphology. So geomorphology is the study of the surface of the earth. We're like geologists, but we look at the surface, not underneath. We don't go under the ground. So geo is earth and morphology, shape of. So we explain landscapes. Why do landscapes look the way they do? I'm a coastal geomorphologist, and so I understand coastal systems, how they work, how they change, and what they do for us. Okay, we want to talk about central Illinois, uh, a little bit later in the program, but mm -hmm. first, what is happening down in, in New Orleans and in the Delta area of the Mississippi River that what used to be there has disappeared? You need some of our silt to, to replenish? Absolutely. The Mississippi Delta is where the river meets the sea. And so over thousands of years, the Mississippi has built this huge Delta plain, millions of acres of wetland. The good thing is that it's actually still largely intact. Compared to other big deltas in the world, we haven't drained it and converted it to agriculture. We've built a city like New Orleans, but for the most part, we've still got millions of acres of natural landscape in Louisiana. It's not pristine though. We've done a few things to it, and it's really in a downward spiral at the moment. We lose about 24 square miles of land a year to the open water of the Gulf. Now, land for us is anything that has vegetation growing on it. So it's not solid land, it's not rock, but a marsh with healthy vegetation, that's land to us. That's land to all of us. That's what this ecosystem is made of. 24 square miles a year of that is changing from marsh with grass growing on it that you could see and take a picture of to open water. Before we go any further, I need to explain to the audience that you are detecting a British accent. That's she right. She is not native to New Orleans. Um, you uh, went to school at the University of Cambridge? That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I worked in uh, the UK for a couple of years, and then in 1986, almost 25 years ago, I came to work in coastal Louisiana. I've worked on other systems around the United States, but most of my work has been on Louisiana for the last 25 and years. And that attracted you because? I work on mud. I mean... And that's where you can find a lot of mud. That's right. I did my yeah. PhD work on marshes just north of the Thames Estuary in London, near London. And so Louisiana was just opening a new marine lab in the mid-1980s, and they knew they had an issue with sediment. They knew that sediment was the key either too much or too little to what was going on down there. And so they were looking for somebody who did that. And here I am. How big, how significant is the, the watershed basin of the Mississippi River? The Mississippi is definitely a world-class river. The watershed, that's the area of the continent where the water drains down into the Mississippi River. That is the third largest watershed in the world. That means in terms of area, that the river drains. It's the third largest in the world. As far as the amount of water that's in the river, about the sixth largest in the world. This is definitely a world-class ecosystem. I mean, if you look at a map of North America and you plotted the Mississippi drainage basin on it, it's hugely the big, obviously the biggest thing there. It drains you know, 40% of the country, three Canadian provinces, all the way from the western part of New York, all the way over to, to uh, Yellowstone, all drained down. So before we get into specifics about what we need to do in New Orleans and mm -hmm. how Illinois can help that, mm -hmm. uh, what has the, the, the Louisiana area been like in the past? Is there a description of what that land is, especially down by the Mississippi Delta? Well, coastal Louisiana and the Mississippi Delta area was built by the river. So five or six thousand years ago, there wasn't any land there. 
The house, excuse me, the land where my house is, is only about 2,500 years old. So think about that. 2,500 years ago, for other parts of the world, we have recorded history. You know, we know pretty much what was going on in places like Egypt and Greece 2,500 years ago. We have books that describe it. The land wasn't even there then. So what happened over the last five or 6,000 years is the Mississippi, big, huge river with lots of sediment in, started building deltas down there. And so a delta happens when uh, a fast flowing river, a big river like the Mississippi that has lots of silt and sediment in it, it meets a quieter body of water like the Gulf of Mexico. And basically it comes from having a channel flowing fast to spreading out and the water slows down and the sediment drops out and the sediment drops out and the sediment drops out and gradually you build up land. It's the same thing that happens when a river flows into a reservoir, for instance. You know, you can get very small deltas when rivers flow into reservoirs. It's just a flowing body of water carrying sediment flowing into a quieter body of water. In this case, we're talking about the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico, so we get some very big results. So what happens? And this is exactly the same way that deltas work in other parts of the world, like the Nile Delta, for instance, works just like this. The river starts to build a delta and builds a delta and builds a delta, and it gradually builds out an area of land, and the river is flowing through this new land, and it just starts getting a very inefficient way for the river to move. And so at some point during a flood or something like that, the river will switch its course and start building another delta in another area. If you think about the Nile, the delta of the Nile that flows into the Mediterranean, you imagine that as having several kind of branches. You know that the river comes and then it branches. That's exactly the same thing. It switches from one location to another over time. That's what happened in coastal Louisiana. So we have one delta and then another and then another and then another. About every thousand years or so, for the last five or six thousand years, the river has switched its course. So the siltation that mm -hmm. has been coming down the Mississippi mm -hmm. hasn't been coming down in the volumes that in the past has been the case. Well, that is one of the things that has changed. I mean, we understand as scientists how this system developed over five or 6,000 years. What we also understand is that the 20th century was very different from the previous several thousand years. In the 20th century, things started to change dramatically. One of the things that changed, as you pointed out, was the amount of sediment that comes down the river. That's for a number of reasons. We built a lot, built a lot of dams, particularly on the Missouri. The big dams on the Missouri hold back a lot of sediment, and the Missouri side of the drainage is where a lot of the sediment comes from, and other locks and dams on different parts of the system. We also, if you, if you go down the Mississippi on a boat, you see that once you get further down and you start seeing, you get away from the area where there's high land immediately next to the river, you start seeing the natural channel banks. Most of those now are covered in what we call revetment or riprap. They're hardened to prevent the river moving and to prevent pieces of the bank falling into the river. And so that, again, changes the sediment dynamic of the river. It reduces the amount of sediment coming downstream. Naturally, a river would be eroding from one place, depositing in another place, and gradually moving around. Having a river like that doesn't really suit the way that we want to use the river. We need to have commerce on it. Barge traffic is really important. You know, we've got to get the grain and the soybeans from up here out. And so those barges have to get down. We have to navigate on this river. So we've done lots of things to it that have changed the way the sediment moves. So we have less sediment reaching the Gulf now than we did before. But the main thing is not how much sediment we have, but what happens to it when it gets to the bottom end of the river? It used to be that it would spread out and nourish the wetlands or build new land. What happens now is the river, once you get to the bottom part, is really in a straitjacket. It has levees on either side of it, levees that are there to prevent flooding, but those levees keep the river in one place. And eventually the sediment and the river just is channeled straight into the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't get a chance to build new land anymore. So a grain of silt 
that you see in the Illinois River that gradually makes its way down through the Mississippi all the way down to Louisiana, where does that end up? It doesn't end up in the wetlands of Louisiana. Currently, it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. So it doesn't matter at the moment how much we have because we're not actually using the sediment that we get to build land. Well, the complexity of the issue is such that you, you mentioned commerce with, uh, Absolutely. And, and of course it, it's ocean going vessels down there, barges up here. Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, the livelihoods of fishermen, oyster, the guy that, that uh, gets oysters mm -hmm. is going to say, well, if you create more land here, that might affect fresh water versus salt water. Oh yes, it's a hugely complex issue. But I think very tractable if you really start to pull it apart and understand each piece. So we, we know about commerce, right? We've got to have deep, deep draft ships, ships that big ships, container ships and belt carriers coming in and we've got to exchange cargo, grain elevators and those kinds of things to get it from the barge to the big ship. We also have a very important oil and gas industry. I think everybody's familiar with that now uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And those pipelines from offshore come across the coast of Louisiana. There's also the seafood industry. Coastal Louisiana, the delta of the Mississippi, supports 30% of the seafood consumed in the United States. So this is hugely valuable industries. This isn't about what happens in a little town in Louisiana. This is about big business and national scale business for this country. And that's why it impacts us directly right here in Illinois. Oh, absolutely. Not only are we connected by the river itself, by the water flowing and by the silt in that river, but we're connected by the things that we grow here and the goods that we buy and the exchanges that we want to make. It's the economy that connects us as much as the river. As, as you and of course you're uh, looking at this very for, for a long time yeah. in terms of how do we manage all of these pieces to make sure that it works. Are there any other rivers in the world that you can equate the Mississippi to and learn some lessons from? Well, I think that we can understand a lot about what is possible from looking at other rivers. And we can also maybe learn some lessons about things that we shouldn't do from other, from other rivers around the world. Um, I think one of the things that's different about the Mississippi Delta, certainly the lower part, is that it's still pretty much a natural landscape. If you think of other big deltas, like the Nile, for instance, or the big rivers in, uh, in China, where they um, uh, discharge into the ocean, those are low-lying lands with abundant fresh water supply, and they're very fertile lands. These are actually the cradles of civilization uh, um, and have been historically. Great flat land, great places to grow crops, great places for people to live. They've been great important centers of commerce for thousands and thousands of years in many places. But what that also means is that they have lost a lot of their natural wetland because they've converted it into rice fields or other kinds of agriculture in order to support population. We're very lucky in the sense that our world-class river still has a delta that is pretty much in its natural state. And then of course we look to states like Illinois to grow the food for us. Do you see the future? And I, I, I <laughs> you could probably talk an hour on that, but. I, I guess, let me refine that question. We should not be restricting silt going into the Illinois River, but we should control the amount we put in so an appropriate amount comes down. And the, the, the argument always has been, well, the, the Illinois River flattens out south of Peoria, mm -hmm. very slow moving. Mm -hmm. So the silt is going to fall out of mm -hmm. the mainstream of the water mm -hmm. into the bed and clog things up. And it's never going to get down to you not going to do you any good, but right. that's not where it stays. Well, we have to think about how rivers work normally. And, and one of the important dynamics of rivers are floods, that the water goes up and down. It's not the same flow all times of the year, and it's not the same level of flow every year. And so periodically on a river, you should have a flood. And a flood is important because it flushes that sediment out. That's the way these systems work. It's not that a sediment grain is picked up in one place and stays in the water all the way until it gets to the Gulf of Mexico. No, it would be picked up and put down, picked up and put down, picked up and put down. The key thing is to make sure that it, it does get picked up again eventually. So you can imagine some temporary deposition being part of how a natural system would work. But there would also then be a flood that would carry it off and carry it away. 
Now, interestingly, though, we want sediment in Louisiana to rebuild our wetlands. And, and wetlands are actually one of the features that are commonly used to retain sediment in systems like this. You know, we build wetlands into our, our sediment retention systems because they're very good at trapping sediment. You know, the grass kind of traps it and holds it in place. So that just illustrates for us that, that wetlands uh, are, are very good at catching that sediment and holding it down and, and that that's where the sediment should be. What we have to do is think about how we can recreate the natural dynamics of our system. So we generate, excuse me, sediment that is generated when it rains gets into a, it gets into a part of the system where it can eventually be carried downstream. That it doesn't sit for too long in, an air, in any area, silt up and then cause problems for the other things that we want to do there. Let me talk about the, uh, or let me ask about the impact of two major events, one natural, one mm -hmm. man-made. Let's talk about Katrina first. Yeah. The, 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 some of, and I'll, I'm going to use the term barriers mm -hmm. uh, that were that protected the marshlands, etc., mm -hmm. are no longer there, and that's part of why Katrina was so devastating to uh, the coastal Louisiana. Well, if you think about the city of New Orleans, for instance, right, which is what many people think of when they think of the disaster that was Katrina, a um, hundred years ago. Well, one important thing first is that New Orleans is not right on the coast. You know, we tend to think it's, it's of it as inland, a coastal yeah. city, but it is inland, say 50 miles uh, from the Gulf of Mexico. And if you go back 100 years, it was surrounded by a big swath of wetlands. And then there were some bays and open water bodies. And then a system of barrier islands, sandy barrier islands, right at the edge of the Gulf of Mexico with, with beaches and those kinds of things. And so we used to have a city and wetlands and a little bit of water and barrier islands. And so what's happened during the 20th century when everything really started to go to hell in the handbasket down there is we lost a lot of the wetlands and the barrier islands really started to degrade very rapidly. And so instead of having a city with a natural buffer around it, you had a city with like a piece of tattered cloth around it that was really gradually disintegrating. And so when Katrina came in, and Katrina was a big storm, uh, if the wetlands had been intact, um, it still would have been bad, but maybe not quite as bad. Um, then it just means the city is sitting there, you know, looking almost directly at the Gulf when a kind storm kind like that comes. Hmm? Kind of bare? The city oh, was bare? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it still has some wetlands around it, but that's the reason that we're so worried about wetland loss in Louisiana, is that we are in a downward spiral. Things are changing year after year after year. It's not like we've lost land and now the whole problem has stopped and we're in a new normal. We're not in a new normal yet. We are on a downward hill. And so that means that every year there are less and less wetlands around the city of New Orleans. The other is man-made, and that is the um, oil leak down in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, from, a, from a marshland, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what you look at. Mm -hmm. uh, from that point of view, how bad was that? Well, we really were very lucky. When you look back at, at, at this time last year and, you know, oil was starting to come out and nobody really knew, you know, how bad this was going to be or how long it was going to go on. We were very concerned about providing what defense we could for our wetlands. One of the issues there is when the oil gets into the marsh, it's pretty difficult to clean up. You know, these are very soft soils. People going in there and trampling around just almost destroys the marsh as well as not being very effective in getting the oil out too. So we tried to do lots of things to really keep the oil out of the marsh. And we ended up being really lucky. There are a few places where it's pretty bad. But in the overall scheme of things, when you think about land loss in Louisiana, when we look back at this, you know, 20 years from now, I think that what we lost associated with this oil spill will be small compared to what we've lost from all the other factors that are still going on. When the sediment does come down to the coastal area of Louisiana, yeah. is, is this a case of, at least with the area where you study with the marsh, marshes, that you want plants to be able to take root mm -hmm. uh, because that's what's going to keep the siltation in place. Yeah, yeah. What, what we need to do in coastal Louisiana is not so much stop the loss that's going on now, although slowing it down would be great, but we need to st start building land again. We've essentially limited land building to just a very few small places. Most of this sediment goes into the deep water of the Gulf. 
One of the things that a lot of people learn from the oil spill, terrible way to learn this lesson, is that there's very deep water just off the mouth of the Mississippi River. So imagine all of that sediment, 120 million tons of sediment a year, just going into essentially hundreds of feet of water very, very quickly. That's never going to stack up to really build any land. What we have to do is use that sediment resource and channel it into water that's only, say, 10 feet deep then we can start building some land. That's the way nature does it. Nature spreads the water out with the sediment into shallow, quiet water. The sediment falls out and then we get land. The vegetation starts to grow. Once the vegetation starts to grow, then the plant roots also help to build the soil as well. We get these peaty soils with the sediment and the plant roots working together. So it really, once you get it started, it can really do great things. So, in, in a easy question, difficult answer, what would your recommendation be for those of us who live along the Illinois River? Because there's going to be some people that take, take the message of saying, well, let's throw some more dirt in the Illinois and Dr. Reed will be happy. Is, is there a recommendation or a suggestion as to how we handle our river up here to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the Illinois River? and the right thing for coastal Louisiana? Well, we have to think about how rivers work and we have to think about the regime of the river. And if this river has, uh, has floods still and has periods when it kind of pulses sediment through, then that's a good thing. We don't want sediment to be getting into places where it's just going to stay long term. That's not the way it should be in the upland part of a river like this. Sediment should be conveyed through the system. So we need to keep the water flowing, keep the sediment in the areas where the water is flowing. And hopefully now and again, without too much damage, we'll get a big pulse coming through of water that will push that out. And you mentioned the lock and dam system. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we have it on the Illinois, the Mississippi, uh, the Missouri. So do, do they open up during these heavy water events so that the silt can come down the river? Well, one of the things that we found during the 1993 flood, for instance, on the upper Mississippi, was a lot of the sediment that had been held in the pools behind the locks really did get flushed out. There was actually a lot of concern at that time about the uh, contamination in that sediment that may have been stored there for a long time and that getting swept out. But I think that the idea that every now and again you are going to get a big event and that's going to help flush these systems through. Obviously, we build the lock, we build the dams and the locks to hold water in when there isn't much so that we can navigate through. When there's a lot of water, then um, we can afford to let it, let it flow out. In terms of the delta of the mm -hmm. Mississippi River, is this a case, I mean, we're, we're talking about Mother Nature. Yeah. Is this a case of where humankind is going to assist Mother Nature rather than change Mother Nature? Well, I think that's a very interesting point because one of the things about the future of the lower river, about thinking about the 21st century for, for the Mississippi Delta, is that I don't think any of us are advocating going back to nature, as it were, just letting the system run wild. That is, is clearly um, not going to get society as a whole a desirable future. Navigation on the river is crucial. We have a very important oil and gas industry down there too. We need to have some kind of level of of assurance or expectation about what the future is going to bring so that those businesses can thrive and provide the country what they need. So this isn't about going back to nature. This is about a new way of managing the river. If you think about the history of the river down by the mouth there, in the 19th century, we started managing the river for navigation. We actually put jetties on the mouth because there was a shoaling and a bar building up and ships couldn't get in and out of the mouth of the river. So we put jetties on. That's when, that's when this all started. That's when we started managing this. We, we also started to put levees on the river to stop flooding for plantations and places like New Orleans. After the 1927 flood, we got pretty serious about those river levees and we got very good at it, actually. And so now we, we have a story where in the 19th century, we managed for navigation. In the 20th century, we managed for navigation and flood control. And what happened in the 20th century was the ecosystem went to hell in a handbasket. What we have to do in the 21st century is find a way of managing that river resource as a total asset, if you like, so we can manage it for navigation, flood control, and ecosystem restoration. And our role is to 
control the amount of sediment that goes into the Illinois, but not stop the amount of sediment that goes into the Illinois River. You got it, you got it. And, and allow a system where we can have some floods and pushes of water through every now and again. M and that's, that's mother nature's job. That's mother nature's <laughs> job. But the other thing is we're connected. You know, we're connected. What happens up here affects us down there. We're connected by the river and we're also connected by commerce. This is important. Getting the grain and the soybeans and whatever out the mouth of the river for export is as important as getting that sediment into the wetlands to rebuild them. Plus we want your seafood. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Denise Reed, a professor at the University of New Orleans and a geomorphologist, a coastal geomorphologist. There you Thank you so much for the, uh, the primer <laughs> on why siltation in the Illinois River will help the coastal Louisiana area. And we thank you for joining us this past season on Ad Issue. This is the last program of the season. We'll be back at the start of September with the 24th season of Ad Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. Thank you and enjoy the summer. <laughs>